it's a great honor to now, um, in a second, hand it over to my 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 longstanding and very good friend, Matai Mamen, who's the global head of R&D at Janssen, who's going to be hosting a fireside chat with uh, an individual who needs no introduction, a really um, the, uh, not just an, an icon, but in many ways, the icon of our industry, and that's that's Roy Vagelos. So um, thank you very much, Roy, for joining us. And Matai, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andy. So I will now attempt to introduce the man that needs no introduction. Um, we have the extraordinary privilege today of hearing from Roy. He's coming to us from his very lovely home on Martha's Vineyard. So just a bit of history, Roy and I had the opportunity to meet at the founding of Therabents, where Roy was our chairman of the board for many years and CEO for one. And he was kind enough um, to receive a call from a young and somewhat naive, but pretty enthusiastic guy with some ideas for helping start that company. And he's been a mentor to me ever since. And that was 23 years ago, 1997. So to me, Roy embodies integrity, wisdom, and just a remarkable confidence, remarkable conviction. It's always proven worthwhile to listen very carefully to what Roy has to say and learn from him. Roy's had this uncanny ability to see with great clarity where things are headed, what has to happen in order to achieve our mission, what our mission is and is not. And he's been proven right over and over again. Um, Roy's personal history is known to many of you, and we'll go through some of that in the, in the questions we'll, we'll get. But just briefly, he was born in Rahway as a son of Greek immigrants that ran a small restaurant in the shadow of a giant pharmaceutical company, Merck. And making sandwiches in that restaurant as a kid, I'm fairly sure that Roy or his family didn't quite realize that he would one day run that shadow casting company. He was a chemistry major at Penn, graduating uh, 70 years ago now, 1950, uh, got his MD from Columbia and was at, a, at the NIH for the next decade, where he did some seminal work on lipid metabolism, went to Wash U for another extraordinary decade, moved to Merck in 1975, where he was considered one of the best leaders of all time of any business. He ran Merck Research Labs uh, from 1976 and was CEO for a decade from 84 to 94. So the company under Roy was remarkable in its production of medicines. It totally changed people's lives. It was a brand new way to invent medicines and affected billions of lives. But equally importantly to me and to all of us, he did this with style, with grace, with integrity, and Merck was literally the most respected company on the planet among all industries for years. So we're so Roy. Now let's start. Uh, let's start uh, chatting a little bit. We're in the midst of a COVID nineteen pandemic in which our industry is expected, and I hope uh, expected to develop drugs, antibodies, and vaccines to turn around this terrible situation we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and we're, we have a fair bit of negative sentiment coming from society as a whole, the government, as we do this, this noble thing. That's the setting in which we're speaking today. So first, let's just start off with the basics. Tell us a little bit from your perspective of how you got started in your career. Tell us maybe a little bit about the experience at Merck. Yeah, well, the start was uh, long ago, obviously. And uh, you mentioned the fact that we had a small restaurant in Rahway, New Jersey, where I was a soda jerk, waiter, et cetera. And our customers were largely Merck, scientists, and engineers. The excitement at that time was antibiotics. Penicillin, of course, had been discovered long ago, but it was only available for a few years at that time. And this is the early 1940s when I was interacting with these people. and and. Uh, and so, and my family had no knowledge of uh, uh, colleges or universities. And so when it came time to go to college, I talked with my friends who are our customers. And they said, I'll learn chemistry. So I went to Penn, as you mentioned, and there I really fell in love with, with, with the science. Uh, but after, after uh, my second year, I uh, started thinking what I would do with chemistry and talking with friends, I decided to go to medical school. And, and at medical school at Columbia, I really became very much involved with patient care and, and the ability of, uh, of doctors to affect uh, lives of people. 
And so I went from there for the, from Columbia to the Mass General Hospital, where again, I worked with great doctors and was convinced I wanted to do that the rest of my life. But, uh, but uh, 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 I needed to go to the NIH in order to put in two years of service time because I had been deferred during the Korean War while I was in school. And so I went to NIH, uh, met Earl Statman, an outstanding biochemist who was willing to take on an MD, as he said, you know, I've never worked with an MD. And I said, I've never worked with a PhD. And so we agreed to work together for a couple of years. And after that couple of years, he convinced me to stay on because I would be a better physician when I finished becoming a real biochemist, which I did. It took me 10 years to, to figure that out. And after that, I, as you mentioned, went to Washington U and taught medical students and, and, uh, and uh, graduate students and undergrads. And then I was called by friends at Merck. And they said, would you consider coming to Merck to head up drug discovery? Now, I had not thought about that at all at that point, but they said, you come and visit, uh, you'll have a free ride back to Rahway. And, and so that my parents were still in Rahway, so that was okay. And I, I went to Rahway and I noted that they were not using biochemistry uh, in the way that they might in drug discovery. And go, walking around the labs, I noted much live animal model, modeling of disease and, and very, very brilliant chemist making chemicals unrelated to any specific molecule. And so I had the notion that if one could figure out what molecules, what enzymes, uh, ion channels, cellular receptors might be involved in disease and get a chemist to make a structure that, that would do something about that particular molecule, we might be closer to drug discovery. And, and they were uh, anxious to try it uh, because they had the idea, they had run dry on the previous strategy for research. So molecular targeting sounded good to them. And of course, I'd never done it, but uh, I was, uh, but I had been uh, now, uh, it's actually 20 years in biochemistry. And so I was very anxious to try to bring that biochemistry to bear on drug discovery and do something about human disease. And so that's what we did. And uh, they went from one thing to another. As you, as you go into a new place, how do, how do you turn around a strategy in drug discovery? And uh, what I did was spend the first year visiting with every research group. Of course, it was quite a large group, excuse me, group even at that time. I uh, walked around and tried to figure out what molecule could, could be a target in this disease, whether it be metabolic diseases, uh, uh, high blood pressure, uh, uh, high blood cholesterol, etc. And, and so I, I worked with them directly. And then I thought I should put my neck on the line too. And so I had a friend who had been with me at NIH, Al Alberts, had been with me at NIH and then moved to Washington U and then moved to Merck. And uh, I had taught him biochemistry and he and, he and I had worked together many years. Uh, and the first uh, statin that went on the market in the world, lovastatin. And uh, while that was that was accepted by the FDA when when it was shown that it was effective in safely lowering LDL cholesterol, uh, people really didn't much pay attention until we did that big out, that outcome study called the 4S study with our second uh, statin, simvastatin. It was a Scandinavian uh, simvastatin. A survival study, which was amazing because it, it enrolled 4,400 patients who already had coronary heart disease and high blood cholesterol and treated in a double blind test, of course, with, with uh, half the patients on placebo and half on, on simvastatin. And they were followed until they had an appropriate number of events, which was five and a half years, and then broke the blind and they found that there was a reduction in death from any cause of 30%, reduction in, in death from heart attack, 43%, and reduction in strokes of 30%. All of these were 
of course, statistically significant and very exciting. And that one experiment revolutionized the treatment of coronary heart disease and, and of course, hypercholesterolemia. And, and uh, at the same time, it, re it, it, it was the, the push for the laboratory to recognize that molecular targeting, because we targeted HMG CoA reductase, of course, an enzyme, the limiting enzyme in cholesterol biosynthesis, but that was the way to go. And so that acceptance and recognition that it could lead to important drugs caused, I would say, a revolution also in the laboratory and people being willing to, to take this on. And, and then the, uh, the new drugs just rolled out because they were just waiting. We had a new drug for glaucoma, two new classes of antibiotics, a new way to turn off hydrochloric acid in the stomach, uh, drugs for osteoporosis. Uh, it was just on and on, new vaccines. And, and uh, so it was, it, was a, it was a very exciting time. And, and it demonstrated to me that science is the, the only way uh, to get into something that's really important for health. And, uh, and Merck was the ideal place to do it because of the people we had there who were so terrific. Thank you, Roy. You, you did indeed lead um, you know, a piece of thought there that was revolutionary. That's target-based drug discovery that's really taken hold and obviously how all of the industry does that today. I want to I turn to COVID right now. We're in the middle of this crisis. I'd love for you to give us your perspective on the response by the pharmaceutical companies. There seem to be both opportunities and watchouts. And so what do you, what do you feel about how the industry is responding? Well, first of all, I congratulate the industry, which you know, has been carrying a burden of uh, people disliking us. Uh, I congratulate them on taking on the challenge because there's no place that this can be done as, as it can be done in the biopharmaceutical industry. So they've taken on all the challenges. I mean, and you mentioned them earlier, and that is uh, drugs, antibodies, vaccines, uh, specific drugs, non-specific drugs, et cetera. And they're going at it whole hog. And I think that's terrific. And that's what they do well. They, they jump onto opportunities and they, and they go like hell, and they compete. That's just what you want. Uh, and, and I want them to compete. I want them to make profit. So I, I, uh, I think the, uh, that's a, a terrible, terribly important part of our system. And that is people are, in fact, incented by making more money. That's not bad. That's good. Because it, it, it brings in a certain kinds of people who have great drive. And, and so they've done that. But a couple of things that, that uh, I think they could do a, a little better. Uh, uh, one is, is not, to, not to talk so much about what they're doing. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, announce what they're doing so people know that the mechanisms are being covered. Uh, we don't want everybody working on just antibodies or just, or just vaccines, but we do want more than one on each class. I would like to have you know, three or four companies on each class to make sure that we're going to get the best products in the end. And, and, uh, so I, I, I think uh, less chatter and, and uh, uh, continue working like hell and focusing. Uh, the the uh, uh, willingness to take government money bothered me enormously. Uh, we, we never did that at Merck for one reason, and that is we wanted to be independent of the government. And we wanted to be independent in how we do it and also what we charge for our product. And, and so... We, we uh, turned down, especially for vaccines, uh, in, in request by government to give us money. And uh, the, it appears that almost everybody is taking some money from the government now. Why? Because obviously it reduces your risk. And I can understand that. But you also give up independence. And, and that I would not have done. But, but listen, my, my own company, uh, Regeneron, has done it. And I can understand and uh, there's an argument on the other side, but that's where I would be. But I think the, if anyone can be looked to, to do something about this problem, it's the biopharmaceutical industry, as was shown previously with the HIV epidemic, AIDS. You know, I, of course, 1981 is when it broke. And, and uh, 
for a couple of years without a known cause, uh, which caused the AIDS, and then HIV, then the virus was identified, and then one one reaction of the virus after another, as the virus was studied, uh, the retrovirus, <coughs> excuse me, retrovirus uh, uh, re re reverse uh, transcriptase inhibitors, the entry, uh, the protease inhibitors, the entry inhibitors, etc., one after the other, so that they could be combined to prevent resistance. That was magic of our industry. We took a disease that was 100% lethal in a relatively narrow group of people, gay males and intravenous drug users, and, 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 and produced drugs which were absolutely magical in converting a disease 100% lethal to a, a situation, a chronic infection where people go back to work and live normal lives. Incredible. Now, could we go further? Yes. I think a vaccine would be better. So people would not have to take drugs, and 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 has the has the industry failed? I well, no. I say they tried like hell. They tried very very hard to make vaccines. As the government pushed, the industry pushed, but the science wasn't there. We just weren't ready to do that. And, and so at some point you have to you have to stop and wait for the science to catch up. And that's what they did. But this was one, in, one instance where, where uh, the, the ceiling was falling in. Every, when, I can remember when, when government was trying to figure out how many more hospitals had to be built to, to receive the, the onslaught of, of dying uh, HIV people. And, and, uh, and that, of course, was all solved by the industry. Now, the price. Uh, which is resented by some people. I don't. I don't know what it is today. Around twenty-five thousand a year. I say is a bargain, a real bargain. And I mean, we have pricing problems in in, in the United States, maybe globally, you might say. But but uh, uh, some of our drugs are uh, not only well priced; some of them are underpriced for what they accomplish. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, twenty-five thousand uh, dollars a year. For someone who now is a taxpayer making a fair amount of money, may even be philanthropic as, as, a, as someone who has had the disease. And so, yes, uh, our, our uh, industry is fantastic in what it can do. So, um, I like especially your comment about less talk, more action for, <laughs> for what we're doing. Hey, so when, when continuing with COVID for a second, like, so. One one of the observations right now is that um, individual governments, especially wealthy governments, are in fact partnering with companies, giving them money either directly for drug development or for advanced purchase agreements for a vaccine uh, or a drug when it when it gets created. You know, we the J and J organization, Merck, um, many of the global pharmaceutical companies are in fact global. And we think of drugs that we're making for all sick people on the planet to treat or prevent illness wherever possible. So maybe to shift a little bit, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on what our role is as an industry to treat everybody and not just um, you know, the particularly wealthy? And I know that uh, Merck has a long history in some of what it's done exactly along these lines. Well, there are, of course, many ways for different situations, and uh, uh, at this moment, I would say what I see happening is that people are making deals uh, among companies that are inventors and those that have capacity to to produce the kind of molecules that that are being invented. But the the, the ones that will be the, the most difficult to handle will be the uh, biologicals. The antibodies and the vaccines, and 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 those are being, of course, uh, looked at by everyone. Uh, so the capacity by having many companies come in uh, means that we'll have, I hope, more than one vaccine, more than one antibody, and, and numerous new drugs coming along. And so they will be; it'll be spread throughout the industry. And may the best man or woman, uh, better woman. Uh, uh, win, win this race because there's going to be a huge market 
uh, for this disease from what we're seeing. And, and, and this, this uh, virus is tough and it's continuing to take American lives and other global lives. And so we've really got to do it now. So, so the, the, the investments are being made. Uh, the capacity is being built. Will it be in time? I think if it's done rationally, then I would like to see an international organization get together and say, you know, what do we, what, what do we have to do to cover global needs, and and uh, and and, ha and hash it out among the uh, the people who who are right, the, the players, and come up with the plans. But the uh, um, and I think the world is ready for that. I think globally, people are perhaps our president is it. But but the rest of the rational world is, and and uh, I think th people are really thinking in those those terms. I don't think anyone is looking at at uh, this disease as a time that they're going to make a lot of money, a killing, and uh, in, in, in their new product. This because the focus is on on having the drug, what it can do safely, and then what will be the cost, and so. The industry would be insane to, for a company to come up with an outrageous price. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the pressure's on. The fact that they are selling to the government, in, in some instances, they're pre-selling before, but they have, before they have the product. They're making arrangements to uh, give the first million doses to the government at a certain price. The government, therefore, the the government is already a player, and and so. So we've given up the uh, we've given up the idea of, of totally free pricing. That the the government is going to be the negotiator, and and they will see to it that the price is is I hope right in giving an incentive, a continued incentive for the for the industry as as well as getting the product. But in the past, there are two instances that Merck stood out while I was there, and we had the capacity. Uh, one was the one, one was the uh, drug for river blindness, as, as some of you may have heard about that. That was a drug that was discovered by Bill Campbell leading the group. He was our top uh, 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 parasitologist at Merck at the time, a wonderful scientist, wonderful person, and who discovered ivermectin. Ivermectin is a drug that the target is, is a uh, ion channel. It, it, it gloms onto the onto the uh, uh, ion channel, the chloride channel, and excites it so that it's open. Chloride pours into the nervous system and paralyzes the parasites. And it does this in exceedingly low, low doses, low concentration. And so it was a dynamite drug, uh, but, but it, it did, not, did not work with uh, hookworms or tapeworms. So it was not going to be used for humans. It, it worked only. It worked in all the gastrointestinal worms of animals, and so it was developed as an animal drug until 1981, when a couple of Bill Campbell plus uh, Muhammad Aziz, a uh, uh, infectious disease doctor, uh, who had the notion that this drug might work in river blindness, which is a parasite called Uncocercovulus, which is a worm that that is transmitted by a black fly that breeds along river banks and therefore river blindness. This, this, this fly carries the, the, uh, uh, my, uh, the, the microfilaria, the babies of this parasite that go through the black fly. He picks it up by, by uh, uh, biting an individual with that parasite. And then, and then uh, within the fly, the, the parasite matures uh, it goes into another person that's bitten. It becomes a worm of about 12 inches long in the skin, making microfilaria that crawl all, all through the body and, and get into the, eye, into the eyes, cause inflammation and blindness. There were 100 million people who were in, in jeopardy at that time, and 18 million were going blind at that moment when we started working on this. And then... Uh, Mohammed Aziz went to West Africa, took a bunch of patients, gave them one tablet. First of all, he took a pinch of skin, counted the microfilaria. There were about 20 microfilaria per milligram of skin. And then he gave one tablet 
to a couple dozen of these people, came back in a month, took another pinch of skin, looked under a microscope, and there were none. We called in the World Health Organization experts who came in, looked at the data, and they said, you guys really screwed up. I said, well, what do you mean? They said, if you killed all the parasites, the, the people would be, they'd be unconscious from side effects because that was their earlier experience with killing the onchocercovolvulus parasite. And, and uh, so they walked out on us. They didn't want to work with us. So Merck undertook the program knowing that the patients were among the poorest in the world, sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of Asia, Latin America, but 100 million of them. So Merck did a study which uh, was done in Africa, about 1,000 patients, where they, they counted the, the uh, 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 microfilaria in a pinch of skin at, at time zero. Then they gave everyone a tablet uh, and, and uh, came back in one month, three, six, nine, 12 months each time counting the worms, and there were no microfilaria at, at one month, three, six, nine. At 12, there were very few. And so it was clear that we had a, a drug that would, that would work when given one tablet once a year. And so we said, wow, now how do we get it to the patients? And the, uh, of course, the marketing people said they'd come up with a price that would be good. Well, they couldn't. And so we turned to governments and, and tried to sell it to the government. They didn't want to buy it. So I went to the US government and uh, met with uh, John Whitehead, who was Deputy Secretary of State at the time, and then told him about this story. He got very excited that, Roy, we're gonna plant the American flag all over Africa. I said, yes, John, let's do it. So he walked out of his office and his, and his assistant said, Dr. Vagel, That'd be great, but you know, we don't have any money. I said, we're talking about a couple million dollars to start the program. He said, we don't have it in the budget. I said, okay. So we left. Then we heard from the French. Uh, we had finished the studies and, and the, uh, and, excuse me, very, we had uh, filed it all over the world, of course, and not in the US because there's no river blindness. But in France, they had people from French Africa with river blindness in Paris. And so they were very quick to approve the drug. We did not have a way to, to get the drug out to the people at that moment. So over the weekend, we decided that, and, and, and announced on a Monday, the next Monday, that, that Merck would, would contribute the drug free to anyone in the world for as long as it was required. And, and uh, I had no idea what we were getting into at that time, but, I, but we had to do it. It was the only thing we could do. It was a bombshell within Merck. The people just loved the idea. And among our stockholders, it was amazingly positive. I don't think we received a single negative letter, but we received hundreds of letters. At any rate, so the program started in 1987. And uh, uh, last year, oh, I, I didn't mention, there's another, uh, another parasite that we discovered also is susceptible to, uh, to uh, uh, ivermectin, and that is lymphatic filariasis, the, the bug that causes elephantiasis, also can be controlled with one tablet once a year. And so we put them all together. So last year, Merck treated free, catch this, 300 million people in one year. 300 million people, that's unbelievable. And of course, I've, long, I've been out of work for 25 years, but that's the one thing that lasted. And uh, it, it's a fabulous program. And then and we did, uh, I mean, quickly, we did another program in, uh, in China after we had developed the, uh, recomb the first recombinant vaccine in the world, which was aimed at hepatitis B, which causes liver cancer and liver disease. We found that although that hepatitis B has an incidence of 0.4% in the US, outside in China, the incidence was 9%. And it was the number of two cause of death. And in the, and in the era where we had the vaccine, they had no money. The Chinese in the late 1980s could not afford it at half the price, at half the cost to make the drug, to make the vaccine. That, sorry, 
uh, yes, the vaccine, the hepatitis B recombinant vaccine. And, and, uh, and, and so in, in this instance, they had very smart people who are capable of doing things. So we invited engineers and, and scientists from Beijing and Shenzhen, two different places, uh, to come to America. They came for one year and they spent the time learning to make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine. They, uh, then they, they went back to their two cities, to built two plants along with our engineers. Uh, so we, they went together. And they started this on so 1994. Uh, the two plants were ready to roll to start producing to immunize all the newborns because there's so many people infected and the transmission is from mother to newborn within 48 hours. If you immunize in the first 48 hours, you prevent this disease. And so we started in 1994 and each year, they within a short time, the Chinese were were vaccinated virtually everyone, 100%. They can do that in China. And, and, uh, and so Merck helped them, uh, charged them seven and a half million dollars once to pay for the, the travel and the, uh, the lodgings of the, of the uh, Chinese. But otherwise, it walked away, never made a penny of profit, but uh, uh, it, it converted uh, the number two cause of death uh, based on 9% of people being infected with hepatitis B to less than 1%. And that was done by Merck with no profit at all. So there are different ways to cover the needs of global disease uh, uh, among global people. And, and uh, I think it's up to the industry uh, to come through and, and solve these things because they have it within their means to do that. And it's, it is the best way to run the business. Roy, well, it's a sophisticated um, set of ideas, right? To simultaneously think first and foremost about the patient, make a fair profit where that is uh, a fair and right thing to do, but recognize that there are large populations and both the ivermectin story and the hepatitis B virus story in China, you know, chosen different mechanisms. And I'm hoping the industry continues in that light. We're trying the same thing in my company with tuberculosis. Ebola, um, multiple companies have played big roles. And now hopefully COVID-19 is an opportunity for the industry to do all of the above, you know, to come forward with um, really, really useful therapeutics and vaccines. Uh, I'm and, sure they're going to do this. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to do it because the, the focus is on them. Uh, they all want to perform and be first. That's good. Uh, and and uh, I'm very optimistic that this is going to happen, but probably not in the, the time frame that our president is predicting and, and causing the uh, all kinds of uh, uh, turmoil in the press, because there's no way you can get one year of safety in three months. No, not by the election, most likely. Yes. So maybe maybe to continue in that theme, but shift a little bit, you know, the, the, the goal again of our, our industry is to treat um, the world's population, I would say, the, the population of sick people in, on the planet. So, but there are incentives, you know, in our system and they're evolving. And what we've witnessed over the last 30 years is this relentless decrease in the number of patients that companies seek to treat. So we had a panel earlier on rare diseases, um, there's been, as the patient numbers are dropping that we're, we're treating, this other relentless increase in the price per treatment uh, uh, for those patients and for insurers. So I'd love to get your thoughts and advice to us on that, like specialty versus broad primary care um, and so forth. And so give, give us your thoughts here, Roy. Yeah, well, I'm not big on uh, specialty and uh, broad market because uh, uh, that's not my language. My, my way of looking at disease is that, first of all, you follow the science. And that is, uh, you enter a disease class uh, with research when your scientists have some idea that the science is now ripe to do something about this condition. And that hopefully will be a condition that has a broad impact on population. You know, I, 
as a physician, I am a physician by training. Uh, I would like to, to impact the most people that I can during my lifetime. And uh, if, if one to take uh, diseases that cause uh, the, the, the globally are five or 10,000 people or, or 100,000 people total, uh, you're going to have a lifetime which is rather limited in the impact. And, uh, and uh, not so, so I, I, I w would like to say that follow the science. The science, if it starts with a small number of patients, might be an entree into a whole class that it goes beyond the initial target of types of patients and, disease, and diseases that might be uh, uh, appropriate for that uh, drug. So, so uh, most importantly, I think if one comes across a possibility that brings you to a rare disease, take it on, but don't take on too many because, because they fill your pipeline and they will block more important, by more important, I mean diseases that are much more broadly uh, rep represented in our, in our society. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, what we need today, or we, we need, of course, today to take care of this uh, coronavirus problem, uh, COVID-19. But, but long term, uh, we're not finished with, with uh, cancer. And while you can focus on one cancer uh, with your approach, th that drug uh, can be studied in many different cancers and may be much broader than where you begin as you understand it better. Uh, so cancer with immuno-oncology uh, breaking open one area after another, I think has been going to be near term, one of the major areas which might start small, but become very big and hopefully cover some of the ones that are still dread cancers for which we can do damn little. Plus the, the uh, pancreatic cancer, for instance, where, where I think uh, for, for whatever reason, very resistant to everything that, that, that has come along so far, but still a huge uh, problem for, for society because, because it's untreatable and, and it's relatively, there's quite a bit of it around, but the looming out there are the neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, the uh, ALS is, was, was the target for Regeneron when they were born. Uh, 1988. That was what they were going to work on, and then they worked like hell for a number of years before it became clear that the science wasn't there at the time, and so that was too early. But neurodegenerative diseases, because of the advances that have been made in universities, largely where pure basic research happens, uh, uh, it's coming along very rapidly now. And and uh, I would guess, well, there are two things that are happening. Uh, the neurodegenerative disease, the, the neurosciences are moving very rapidly at the basic level to really understand the causes of disease. Uh, that's that's uh, coming very rapidly, and and uh, I, I think we'll succumb to drug discovery. We are going to have uh, drugs for that. Uh, the, the psychiatric diseases as well, and and the approaches that are going to be made are in, in part. Will come from genomics, genomics and and, and, and uh, uh, genetics, genetic studies. These vast studies that are going to start pouring in, not a million, uh, not a uh, not a million cases of having their DNA sequenced, but a uh, hundred million. Uh, that's gonna that's gonna open up a lot of worlds, and it's going to be the worlds like Helen Hobbs came up with with her. Eight, PCSK9 story, where she concentrated on the people who had very high and incredibly low uh, LDL cholesterol and, and, and found the gene that did that and then followed the, uh, the, 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 the mutants and studying them and came up with an entirely new class of drug. And I think that approach to neurodegenerative diseases, uh, psychiatric diseases, you know, all Essentially, all the psychiatric drugs were found by accident. 
I don't think anyone was designed. And, and so it's time when we, when we have better drugs for schizophrenia, for depression, for all, all, all these uh, psychiatric uh, diseases, and, and Alzheimer's disease, which has had numerous attempts to go out within our industry, uh, I think is, uh, is, gonna, is gonna break. Uh, I don't know when or where, but it's going to break because there's so much effort now and people are so excited about uh, learning new things. Uh, about about the uh, biology of these diseases. And that's what it's gonna take, new information. When that becomes uh, available, I hope there will be an attack as there is on, on COVID by the industry because uh, what I see at my age, age, I'll be 91 in the next month, uh, what I see is, is people suffering. They live long time, but they are incapable of taking care of themselves because of neurodegeneration is what is happening. And uh, we need to solve that and quickly. So Roy, uh, you know, you said something here that's very important that you do begin um, programs because there's science that supports moving in that direction. Um, as you know, as you experience at Merck, as you see at Regeneron, it was true at Theravance, it's true at Merck, at J&J, uh, it's it's the beginning of a project or giving birth and progressing a project is a complex process now. And what role do you think you have a lot of R and D senior leaders and emerging leaders listening to you right now? So, what role does the R and D scientist, uh, the 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 scientist, play in beginning projects? What what advice do you have here? Oh my God, oh my God, uh, Matai, as you know, uh, uh, when I was at Merck. Uh, within the first year, I will tell you and immodestly that I felt that I was running Merck. They had Merck at that time had gone through a period where they, you know, they uh, they had a young chemist who synthesized uh, cortisone from scratch, 30, 30 steps uh, synthesis, made cortisone available, and that was the beginning of the steroid era. So that kind of discovery at Merck that turned that convinced management at the time that the the driving force of the company was in their research laboratory, and and so when when, when I when I uh, was interviewed for the job at at uh, Merck uh, after the CEO Henry Gatson told me about what he would like, I said you know there there are uh, couple of questions. I said, you know, what would happen if the company went, you know, business went bad? And uh, I didn't know what I was talking about, of course. But I was just trying to be negative. He said, well, he said, Roy, if, if sales went down the tubes, uh, we would cut back on uh, expenses for everything, sales, marketing, manufacturing, everything. The last thing we would touch is research because science is, is our future. This was a guy whose background was manufacturing, but he, that was so ingrained at, at Merck. And so within, within months after I arrived, I arrived there, uh, we did an experiment uh, with, with a beta blocker, a uh, specific beta blocker that was doing nothing for what it was supposed to do in, in, in high blood pressure control. And, uh, uh, a friend from Yale called and said, you know, do you have a drug that might affect glaucoma? And I said, uh, I don't know, but we'll, we have a lot of drugs. We'll bring them up. He had a model of a, of a, of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, animal, a, a rabbit with gla glaucoma in his eye because they could put, you put a proteolytic enzyme in the eyeball and it becomes like glaucoma. At any rate, we went up there and this guy who was a medical student a couple of years ahead of me at Columbia, and so I knew him. He was chairman of ophthalmology, and, and he had his model. And we, he said, uh, why don't we just put a drop of this, uh, these drugs that you have on, on this rabbit eye, and we put on this beta blocker, uh, and, 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 the, and the pressure just went down. And I looked at that, and I didn't know squat about eye, eye disease, but I knew what, what reducing pressure was. So I went back. Went right to the CEO and I said, uh, Henry, uh, we're going to have a new drug for glaucoma. He said, what, Why would you want to do that? I said, Well, because I just saw 
that, that this drug uh, uh, can reduce the intraocular pressure, and, and uh, that's going to work. Uh, he said, but look, you know, the drugs that are being used for glaucoma are dirt cheap. I said, yeah, but, you know, they all cause problems when you go from light to dark, uh, and, and you cannot accommodate to the light. With this drug, which is a beta blocker, it will have no effect on that light to dark transition, and so it won't have that side effect. There will be a brand new drug that will be very important. Well, that drug, Timoptic, became the leading drug in, in, uh, in the industry for 20 years. And, and uh, so his reaction was, uh, okay, we'll, we'll give it to a, uh, what I told him it was gonna be a glaucoma. He said, we'll give it, we'll license it to a, uh, a, an ophthalmic company. I said, why would you do that? He said, because we're not in the eye business. I said, but you could be with a breakthrough drug. He said, he thought about it, he said, let's try it. But that's how we got into the eye business. They listened to research and I was amazed. I'd been in the company a year at that time and he was the CEO and I was head of drug discovery. And as I say, I had the feeling I was running, I was running Merck from that, from that time because no one ever questioned what was coming from research. Maybe they should have. I love it, Roy. Roy, we just have a couple minutes left, and I wanted to, to get your thoughts for the audience listening on just leadership. Um, so sci there are many scientists that aspire to scientific leadership. Maybe they aspire to broader leadership, um, uh, business leadership. You know, what advice would you have for, for these um, young and emerging leaders today that are steeped in science, they're trained in science, but yeah. they want to learn leadership? What's important in scientific leadership uh, clearly is a, a, a deep understanding of the science and a deep understanding of disease. Uh, because it's, it's, that, it's that intersection where new science reveals something in a disease where you have the technology or can develop technology to affect that molecule. And, and, and the, your scientific leaders are the people who can one after the other hit those intersections and come up with a new mechanism of action drugs. And, and that's what we were able to do at Merck because if, when, as I say, you know, it's like a baseball, picking a, an ace baseball player. You want someone who doesn't hit an occasional uh, home run, but you want someone who gets on base or, or hits a home run on a regular basis. Yeah. And, and, and so uh, repeat, repeating uh, good performance and in getting into field, understanding the science, understanding disease is what it's about. And how do you do that? You can't do it alone. You pick top people in science and they come from everywhere and, and, uh, uh, and, and they're very special. And we were very fortunate in the kinds of people who were at Merck while I was there because they did magic. And, and I think that's what's possible in our industry. Beautiful, Roy. I knew it would be a wonderful conversation. It was exactly as I imagined. So thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to be with us today. It's genuinely thanks. appreciated. Thanks, Matai. Come and visit us up on the vineyard. I will do, I will do.